Hello, this is the first lecture for week 33 of textual analysis and argumentation, spring semester 2011. This is one short final week that we're doing here of textual analysis, and our, our final author is Walt Whitman. And we spent a long time just now on our first full novel, uh, and only full novel of the year, and uh, here in our final week before we turn to review in the last two weeks, we're going to uh, head back to poetry. She spent a lot of time with in in, uh, in the fall, especially. I wanted to give you guys a week on Whitman um, because of really of our theme of slavery and freedom that we're finishing up with here that we've been with for many weeks now. Um, I think that, that Walt Whitman, uh, who is perhaps the most important um, American poet um, in establishing American poetry as a, as a real global legitimate literature, um, <clears throat> along with Emily Dickinson, who we aren't reading in the class. But Whitman and Dickinson are the two poets who really get American poetry started in the middle and late 19th century. But Walt Whitman, in particular, um, has a vision of the country that is defined by uh, freedom, that is defined by a, a certain kind of escape from constraining factors. And I want to... Uh, give you a little bit of Whitman also because of our time with Thoreau back before we did uh, Huckleberry Finn back in the Frontiers section of the course. And I think that Whitman takes up a lot of what Thoreau uh, was writing not very long before and uh, turns it into really a, a vision of society, a vision of community um, based in the idea of freedom in a number of different senses. So we're going to talk about uh, Whitman's frontiers in, in some of the same ways we talked about Thoreau's frontiers, right? And of course, for Thoreau, we know that he took that idea of the American frontier, that vast, uh, expansive, um, free territory at the edges of society, and for Thoreau, really turned it inward and, and found these frontiers, and, you know, um, all over the world and indeed behind the stars within himself. And I know that some of you reacted positively to that, and others thought that that was somehow a kind of an egotistical vision. Um, and I think that, that Whitman actually moves us forward. This poem that we're reading a little bit of is called Song of Myself, but I think that what I want to try to convince you of is that uh, it's a song of, of himself. It's a song about himself, um, but but it's, it's something like the opposite of self-absorbed or egotistical. What Whitman finds within himself is... Um, is a certain way of relating to the landscape as wide open and a certain way of relating to other people, no matter how different they are from him, no matter how uh, um, different they are as people, no matter how different their work is from the work of a poet, that what Whitman finds within himself uh, is this particular kind of uh, open landscape and this particular kind of relationship to other people based especially in the kind of work that they do. Whitman looks into himself and sees the vastness of America as a wide open place where people, uh, that a wide open place that is marvelous partly because of the diversity of things that people do in it. And, and that is his vision of, of America. And it's really a defining literary and cultural vision. So I'm calling this, I'm subtitling this Whitman's Frontiers lecture, Land and Labor in Song of Myself. You'll see a little bit of um, the labor issue in the reading for the first class this week and, and much more of it in the reading for the second class this week. But the second lecture on Whitman that I'm going to give you uh, for the second class of week 33 is specifically about his relationship to um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who is author we're not reading, but who is another really important thinker in this period of American history, American literature. Okay, we're not going to spend very much time on Whitman's biography, um, partly because it's a little bit muddled. I mean, we certainly know the facts of his early life, but they aren't particularly fascinating in, in many respects, right? Um, he's from an upper middle class family. He uh, is, is unsure for much of his young life what exactly he wants to do with himself. He becomes basically an itinerant printer, a typesetter, editor, working with letters and literature and language, but in the context of pamphlets, of newspapers, things like that, right? And, and the one thing that I would really uh, 
the two things I would really want to draw from Whitman's early life uh, is, first of all, the restlessness of it, right? the, the fact that he is unhappy um, in, in, in most of what he does, doesn't stick with anything for too long, uh, and also that it's controversial. In, in fact, in, in one instance, he is, when he was um, teaching school, he was written out of town, he was tarred and written out of town on a rail for being too controversial as a teacher. Um, <clears throat> So he's got this very kind of restless, controversial young life uh, that I think those two things are important for, the, the controversial nature of it and then also the itinerant nature of it, where he doesn't feel settled. He certainly doesn't isn't the kind of person who immediately wants to make a lot of money and, and buy a nice house and settle down. He wants to strike out on some other path, right? And that gets him into some trouble and also means that he is... is finds it very difficult to remain in any one job. But his jobs um, as a young man tend to be um, literary related, right? Either teaching in, in schools or much more often uh, working in uh, publishing houses and, and presses. By the way, this is Walt as a relatively young man there on the left, middle-aged Walt, and then on the right, the elderly Walt, who is this kind of iconic grandfather figure of American poetry and American letters, and uh, really as an American visionary who, who saw who, who saw and was able to articulate a new idea of, of what America is all about. I did want to touch on one uh, movement that the younger Walt Whitman is involved in before he publishes Leaves of Grass, which is the big, um, incredibly um, famous now uh, collection of poetry that includes Song of Myself. <clears throat> and that's a political engagement with a party called the Free Soil Party, um, which was a branch of the Democratic Party, but much more uh, more radical than the rest of the conservative Democratic Party. Um, and they really only existed uh, kind of as a blip on the political radar in the 1848 and 1852 presidential elections. Although in those elections, they were very influential. They had a big impact. Um, they elected, they got Martin Van Buren elected president and um, quite a number of, of, of congressmen and senators as well. And what they stood for, what the free, sto free soil branch of the Democratic Party stood for, um, was opposition to slavery in the Western territories, right? So this really is about what the frontier, it's the question of what the frontier will mean for the country and what the frontier will mean for slavery and for freedom, right? So early on, uh, Whitman's involved in this free soil movement that says, okay, as American ex America expands westward along that um, continually moving frontier, it's crucial that slavery not go with it, that when there are new territories, um, that slavery, that they are free territories, right? And I really like this phrase. I think it's so um, apropos um, of Whitman and, and so suitable for Whitman, free soil. Going back to this frontiers idea that freedom is somehow embedded in that landscape, right? That there's something about the landscape itself that speaks freedom, the American landscape. So I wanted to touch on that. Um, what you see here is a political cartoon mocking the Free Soil Party. That's Martin Van Buren there setting fire to this barn uh, down here on the lower right. And that is, is his son um, helping him out. And this is the uh, candidate for the conservative wing of the Democratic Party, uh, kind of escaping out of the barn. And the joke here is that um, these are farmers essentially burning down their barn to drive out the rats. Uh, which, of course, is a ridiculous kind of overreaction to having rats, right? You ruin the very thing you're trying to save. So the opponents of the Free Soil Party uh, were, thought that the Free Soil people, um, Van Buren's barnstormers, were uh, too radical, too violent. They went too far. They would throw out the baby with the bathwater. But for Whitman, who was a delegate to their first convention, um, the Free Soil Party uh, meant a preservation of the new landscape of America, the frontier, as a free landscape, that that soil would never see the curse of slavery. Right? So very early on, he's involved with this kind of, um, these issues of, of freedom and the frontier, uh, and he's involved with issues of slavery, right? You will see in Song of Myself a few references to slaves or to simply to Negroes, right? And, and we'll talk more about that next time, um, about Whitman's engagement with the issues of abolition and um, freeing the slaves. Okay, Whitman eventually 
sits down and writes Leaves of Grass. He publishes it himself, self-published. I think there was something, uh, 475 copies or something like that, not very many. And part of the reason here is no one was interested in publishing it, right? It's pretty radical stuff for the time. Um, it's, it's experimental poetry for the time. Uh, but Whitman, at a certain point, really comes to grips with the fact that he wants to he wants nothing to do with what he calls the usual rewards. That is, a good, solid, steady job, accumulating property, raising a family, becoming a respectable member of society. All of these, at a certain point of his life, he, he, he recognizes that he's not cut out for that stuff, and he renounces those usual rewards in favor of the vision of self Hood that he sets out in Leaves of Grass, right? And I think here we can think of Thoreau and his clearly flawed escape from society in that he never really leaves society altogether. But it's the same kind of project, back to the basics, rejecting the things that society is telling you you should think and telling you you should do and striking out uh, or lighting out, to use Huck Finn's phrase, for the territories, the territories of the mind, the territories of society, the frontiers of possibility, right? really rethinking society. And if we push this further, I would want to take it all the way back to the beginning of our course this year, where we were talking about European settlers who saw America um, as a, a, a landscape of reinvention, a place where people could reinvent themselves, and where, in fact, society as a whole could reinvent itself. Whitman approaches uh, a point in his life, just before he sits down to write Leaves of Grass, where he really... Uh, articulates that to himself. He's going to get rid of the usual rewards and seek some kind of higher truth uh, and express it in these poems. Most directly, he sits down to write Leaves of Grass, and he had written uh, poetry before, but not very much, and, and not a lot of it, uh, and, and not great poetry before. Um, he writes Leaves of Grass in response to an essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, who was a preacher and an essayist and a transcendentalist like Thoreau. And Emerson wrote an essay called The Poet, in which he lays out a kind of um, demand. He lays out the necessity for a new kind of a specifically American poet that no one so far had, had acknowledged really existed. So those Puritan poets that we read way back in, in the fall, um, they were certainly American poets, and these days we recognize them as really important in certain ways. But they didn't think of themselves as specifically American poets all that much. They didn't think that they were announcing a new, particularly American kind of poetry. There are slight exceptions there, but for, for the most part, um, Emerson, when he sits down to write the poet, is saying to himself and saying to us, we need a voice, a poetic voice for this country. Right? And he described what that voice is gonna, it should be like. And we'll talk uh, more in the second lecture for this week about what he says. But Whitman reads this essay, The Poet, and it is absolutely inspiring to him. He thinks, well, maybe it should be me. And he's utterly lit uh, a fire by this essay. And his response is this book, Leaves of Grass. Right? Um, he says, in fact, uh, in, in later in life, when he was asked you know, about this inspiration of this essay and what it had to do with with finally writing Leaves of Grass, he said um, that he had been thinking about it before, but that Emerson really brought him to the boil. So he says, I was simmering, simmering, simmering. Emerson brought me to a boil. Again, we'll talk more about that inspiration next time. Um, but so Leaves of Grass is the result of this. And what you see here is the frontispiece to the first edition of Leaves of Grass that Whitman prints himself. You'll notice, we'll talk about this in a second, that um, there is no author here. It's Leaves of Grass, no author, only an image, um, an engraving of Whitman, a portrait, but no name, right? And that's going to be important for us. And again, we'll come to that in a minute, um, this certain kind of anonymity that Whitman preserves in Leaves of Grass, at least on the cover page. So what Whitman does in Song of Myself, which is the, the centerpiece of the book of poems, right? The centerpiece of Leaves of Grass, this very long poem um, of which we're reading a little bit, is that Whitman sings himself, right? I celebrate myself and sing myself um, in, in a little bit of the way that Thoreau did, right? Where Thoreau finds within himself, at least when he is there in the woods among nature, um, that within himself he can find the furthest flung frontiers of the world and the highest ideals and, and everything just through this kind of meditative existence in the woods. The difference here is that, that for Whitman, this is a social project. It's, 
every time he sings himself, what he means to do is sing you as well, right? So he's very clear about this in the first lines of the poem. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume, you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me, as good belongs to you. It's a very democratic, um, equality-focused, um, populist vision, right? Um, when he says, what I assume, you shall assume, it doesn't mean um, ideas, just that. It offers you that kind of false reading of saying, okay, what he's saying is, my ideas should be yours too. That's not what assume really means here. The deeper meaning of assume is to put on, right? What I take up, what I put on, uh, the way that you would assume a costume, right? Or assume a position. Um, we are assuming this position together, is what he's saying. He's singing himself, but that self is meant to be a wide open space um, that matches with every other person, everyone. Right? So the difference with Thoreau here, the slight difference is that, that Whitman's not after solitude. He sees this kind of internal vision, this internal poetic vision, as a vision of society, right? as a way of relating to other people and bring us all together in this, this vast kind of freedom. The very famous, famous line of the poem early on is, I loaf and invite my soul. Such a wonderful line, right? And the, um, clearly the, the image of, of Whitman here on the frontispiece um, speaks that, right? You know, he's got his hand in his pocket, his hat's tilted, he's got his shirt unbuttoned. He is loafing out in the countryside, out on the frontier, and inviting his soul to this great poetic project, inviting his soul not only to an enjoyment of the landscape and a love of the landscape, but inviting he's inviting his soul to be there with other souls, to contact other souls here in this country. So I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. Um, there is that, that focus on the landscape. And then finally, this articulation of what the poem is supposed to do, right? So if Whitman is singing himself, um, his song is meant to blend with everyone else's song to actually inspire everyone to sing. So he says, my tongue, every atom of my blood formed from this soil, this air, right? So his very expression, his song comes from the soil, right? And that soil is free, it's free soil, it belongs to everyone. So his song is a song of the earth, a song of the frontier, and it's meant to be everybody's song in that sense. Okay, so if we have this kind of um, massive expanding self, right, that is meant to be able to sing the song of everyone's freedom um, in this in this landscape, uh, I wanted to point us back as well, since we're sort of summing up this week a little bit, um, to Thomas Paine, right, um, who really tries to adopt that uh, liberation rhetoric voice where he is speaking for everyone. He is every man. He is Publius, if we're talking about um, if we're talking about the Federalist Papers, right? <clears throat> so remember that Payne says in Common Sense, in the following sheets the author hath studiously avoided everything which is personal among ourselves. The cause of America is in great measure the cause of all mankind. And I want us to remember here that um, you know, when Payne adopts this voice, the voice of all mankind, um, part of the, the background that he's drawing on was all the different jobs that he had growing up and as a young man um, that he worked in all these different trades, if you guys remember that, right? And that really enables him to feel that he can speak for everyone. And you'll see the same thing in Whitman. Now, Whitman didn't actually have the same kind of diverse experience of labor that Payne did, but, but he observes it all around him, right? And so parts of the poem, really he is trying to draw everyone together um, as a free nation by really acknowledging the beauty of, of what everyone does. The pilot seizes the kingpin, right? The mate stands braced in the whale boat. The duck shooter walks by silent. The deacons are ordained with crossed hands at the altar. The spinning girl retreats. All these things are um, a vastness of vision based on a, a celebration we might accidentally think of himself, but what is actually meant to be a celebration of everyone in their in their differences, in their diversity of what they do. So back to this phrase, free soil, which I think is going to be a key one for Whitman. I like thinking of the name of that branch of the party that he was involved in as a name that really articulates what he's after in Song of Myself, this epic vision of America. And what it sets out is a vision of a, the liberated landscape, right, where freedom is inherent in the self, there is no such thing as a self without 
its inherent freedom, um, whatever the circumstances, um, be, you know, uh, working class difficulty, um, slavery, uh, everyone is inherently free, right, and, and deserves to sing that freedom for themselves. And then also freedom inherent in the landscape, which amounts to the same thing, the landscape is open to all. Right? So these two things go together. There's some consequences here. They're pretty radical for the time, and it makes Whitman controversial. Right? Um, one is that you can no longer say that class divisions between upper class people and working class people express a difference in value. Right? Whitman is singing the beauty of every profession, blacksmiths, priests, anything. Right? So class divisions become um, subsumed in this larger uh, vision of the nation. Right? And of course, slavery becomes completely unacceptable, uh, completely at odds with this vision. So we'll see how some of those actually play out in the poem. So please read this, um, read the selections for this time and next time, and we will talk about them in class.